Troy, Tennessee. You were telling us last night about your start. You were in a rural area, but you could hear the band practicing during or playing during the football games. Is yeah, that what it was? yeah. I, where I lived um, in Troy, you know, it was in the country. It was a great place to grow up. Very small town. We had uh, one flashing red light in wow. the middle of town at the town square, and mm. then eventually that went away, like it fell off or something, and people just still stopped there. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. It's just like a crossroads in the town, and a little bit, little bit town. So and, did everyone know each other? Like, oh yeah, and everybody's in everybody's business, mm -hmm. and you know, even a small town as it was, it probably still had six or seven churches. You know, oh, okay, like, just yeah, real that small. That was probably the, the social life too. Yeah, right? very, very much. And then you have the people that go and the people that don't, and uh, you know, and then you everybody talks about the other ones. You know, so I had to get out of there for that. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, where I lived, um, it was next to a sawmill. And uh, they were in, I had a small backyard my, at the house I lived, a trailer, house trailer actually. And uh, in the, you know, had a little backyard and then there was a big uh, field where cows grazed and stuff and lived in, on this little property. And so uh, next to that was the sawmill and then beyond that was the high school. And so I would hear the, the school band practicing during the summer, you know, during the day. And it was like, you know, the wind would blow the music, you know, mm. over there. And they would be like, what? you know, faintly hearing it and, and it would be uh, like uh, another one bites the dust or we got the beat. Those two specifically, I remember. And they were all, you know, also on the radio at the time. Oh, so you're like, there's and that so song. I'm like, man, there's that song, uh -huh. you know, but like that is not, I don't hear anybody singing. Mm -hmm. Like I hear the melody being played, but it's instrumental. And I could not figure out why it was coming from the sawmill, mm -hmm. you know. And then and after you're, you're about how old? Uh, I would have been probably nine or ten years old uh -huh. at this point. And, and so you, and you were not playing music. Was not before. playing any music. I uh, had just started playing drums. My stepfather uh, was like a hobbyist keyboard player and a mm -hmm. hobbyist drummer guy. As a, he was a drummer first, and then moved into playing piano and wrote a couple of songs. That uh, one of which was uh, Annabelle Lee, which was. Um, recorded by a lot of people as a, it's a 50s doo-wop kind of song and he wrote it when he was 10 years old wow so so and so a song that became a hit yeah it became a hit and it's still played like in Europe he still gets little measly little royalty checks Annabelle from, Lee Annabelle and, and, Lee and what's his name his name's Roy Griffith Roy Griffith okay and so uh, you know he had started dating my mom around the time I was nine and uh, so he brings the keyboard into the house you know oh. and then at his place he had uh, that Gretsch drum kit I was telling you about. He had that drum kit that he had had since he was a boy when mm -hmm. he was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm hearing this music. And then on, on Friday nights, I, it would be really loud, you know. And then I just had to ask. I was like, where is that coming from? And, and my parents, you know, being a parent now, I see how children can ask some questions that are so obvious, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like my mom was like, well, the high school is right there. That's the must be the marching band, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, Wow. So uh, I wanted to play drums, and uh, like I say, I was kind of trying to play by ear, and I was doing pretty good, you know. Were you playing um, with anybody, or were you just Just with like the records, you know, playing with records. You were putting headphones on and playing? Uh, yeah, at first with just the stereo just and playing real it. quiet, oh, playing. you okay. know, and, and, and having practice. it in there. And then moved, my, moved into headphones a little bit later, but... Uh, yeah, so doing that, and then, you know, they come to your school, and they uh, give you, like, a little aptitude test. They make everybody come down, and they play, you know, tones for you, and they play rhythms or whatever. And they ask, you know, some personal questions. Of course, they're asking 10-year-old kids this, you know. And so they ask some questions, and, like, do you, if you were in band, what instrument would you play? Of course, all the boys put drums, and all the girls put flute, you know. And uh, then it's like, if you couldn't play that instrument, what would be your second instrument? And uh, I loved Happy Days and uh, the Fonz, of course. And my name is Arthur and Arthur Fonzarelli, you know. Mm -hmm. And then Richie Cunningham at, uh, at Arnold's would occasionally pick up the tenor saxophone. Uh -huh. And I thought I that looked so that. cool. And it's always in the opening credits you see him playing uh -huh. saxophone. And so I was like that. And then, you know, right about bedtime would be Benny Hill coming on PBS and I'd hear Boots Randolph's Yakety Sax, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was just like, well, I guess if my second instrument, I guess it would be the saxophone. That's uh -huh. pretty cool. 
And so what I found out later was that anybody that put down a second instrument, that's what they, they, got, get, right. they got. They needed people. To yeah, they needed people to not play just drums and flute. You yeah. know, it wasn't the Revolutionary War anymore. So, um, yeah, man. So anyhow, I, I learned how to play the saxophone in school band, and we had a very busted music program. I mean, you know, things are not great now for education, and specifically arts education, but... It, you know, living in a rural area with like a, the high school band director and his wife would have to drive to all of the middle schools, you know, and you'd have band twice a week. Uh -huh. and they, you know, you don't know that note. Well, just hand me your music and they'd write the letter names. Uh -huh. above, you know, so I, before I, by the time I got to high school, I just had to write in all the letter names, you wow. know, and so I was really far behind. And then I get to high school. Well, before I get there, though, I'm listening to the marching band and I, as I was telling you last night, I'd go out on Friday nights after now I've got my saxophone and uh, I would be like just trying to play real quiet and, and play along with the marching and band. And you were playing you quiet because you were worried they would hear you. Well, no, because I, ha I couldn't hear you them couldn't over hear the them hill. Play quiet. <laughs> so, so I had to play like so real quiet. you had to learn quiet, to play quiet you know, to be able to hear them to play to with them. To hear them to play yeah. with them, which you right. later find out when you're in a horn section or especially like a big band or orchestral, you know, concert band, something. It's like, if you can't hear the people next to you, you're too loud. You yeah. Know? And so, and that that's a good good rule to have. And yeah. so anyway, I did that and got to high school and, and still wanted to play drums. And I played drums all through high school in like garage bands, or rock bands, and mm. definitely had Zeppelin too loud, which is why I have my hearing problems now, mm -hmm. but like the headphones on and then beating the shit out of my yeah, drums. So you, 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 know? you probably didn't have the headphones that block out the... Oh, the no, no, no. This yeah, is 19, just, like 86, 87. Crank just crank <laughs> that big really it, yeah. jam box. And then, yeah. of course, if you want those sounds that John Bonham gets, you've got to hit the drum, uh -huh. you know, to get the drum to speak like that. Yeah. Again, not understanding recording mm. and, and, you know... And so uh, my parents built, they got out of the trailer whenever my stepdad married my mom, and they built this nice house and built a garage specifically with a, an upstairs room that was unfinished mm -hmm. just for me to put all the music stuff and to practice the saxophone and play mm -hmm. the drums, you know. That's awesome. And that was great. And they've always been very supportive of me. And uh, also my aunt, Linda Barnes, has been very much a huge supporter and like, you know, just, I mean, it takes a lot of people to get one musician through life, you know what I mean? And so I try to give that back, you know, with music and, and being empathetic to folks. Like if somebody wants us to play happy birthday or like, you know, that's our 32nd wedding anniversary, you know, play the song for people, you know yeah. I mean? So you, you want to be of service to people. I do want to be yeah. of service. And, and uh, it's taken a lot, you know, of uh, assimilating uh, and not just taking this for granted and saying I'm going to be an artist. Like I, I was so far behind, and all I wanted to do was like play with other musicians. I, I had to move to Memphis because there was nowhere to play music where I mm -hmm. lived. You know, there would be like a, the, no kidding, the volunteer fire department white bean dinner once mm -hmm. a year. You know, okay. they, they would once have a year. <laughs> yeah, would have the country band that didn't have a drummer, and, and you know, we'd ask, ask Bubba to come play the drums. You know, so once a year I could go play like country. Uh -huh. You know, at age you know fifteen, sixteen, uh -huh. so, which know. is a cool experience. And probably. Yeah, it's great. It? And then of course they really wanted me because he he's got that sax. Let's get him to pull that sax uh -huh. out and play Tennessee Wall. Uh -huh. Okay, you know, and play Ace Cannon. So the first stuff I learned by ear at all was uh, Ace Cannon's Tough and then Blue Stay Away From Me from the Ace Cannon uh, Greatest Golden Hits or whatever on Gusto Records. Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with Ace Cannon. Oh, dude, he's like the king of uh, Honky Tonk Sax. Really? Yeah, okay, absolutely. I, I lots and lots Ace and Cannon. lots of hits, man. So the Bill Black combo, too. Look that up. Okay. But uh, And that is all Memphis stuff. And so um, in the mornings when I'd be getting ready for school, you know, you're watching some cartoons or PBS or whatever, and uh, they would have an ad for the Ace Cannon Golden Classics, and it's just, you know, on a t bad TV set with the wide collar and, like, the white guy with a perm, and he's got his alto, you know, and he's playing, uh, just standing there, they're playing the tracks, and he's mimicking, and, you know, everything is gauze filtered out, you mm -hmm. know. I was like, man, that's cool. And then there what was... What do you mean filtered out? You know, like it's a real smoky looking. Like, oh, okay. you know, whenever Sybil Shepherd was on Moonlighting, uh -huh. every you know, or like Days of Our Lives when Marlena was there, they'd always kind of gauze it up to uh, soften okay. her features. Uh -huh. So here's, you know, Ace... Sorry, Ace. 
Ace was a terrible alcoholic. And so he looked like shit, you know? And so they kind of tried to, like, make him look a little more, you know, sexy or whatever. <laughs> Angelic. Or Angelic, you yeah. know? And so anyway, I hear those tunes, and I and so I'm like, man, that's saxophone, you know? So that's there, there we go. And then the other ad that would run on the next commercial break was for Fats Domino's 22, you know, golden classics uh, yeah. or whatever. So my mom bought that uh, Fats Domino record off the TV, and she got the Ace Cannon cassette off uh-huh. the TV. And so I had those two records, and then, like I say, the stepdad that had a great record collection, and my mom also always had a great record collection, mm. and then my aunt Linda that was like part helping raise me, you know, uh, she was a huge Elvis fan and still is to this day. Mm. Like Elvis, almost a shrine, uh, you know, in her room to Elvis and. Um, She's in Memphis. Yeah, she lives in Troy. They okay. all my family still up there, but, but, but close enough where I'm sure. Yeah. you know. Tennessee, there's that Tennessee connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's just two hours up the road. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, man. So uh, listening to a lot of that music and and um, playing those Fats Domino records that had Herb Hardesty and Lee Allen on there playing saxophone like nobody's business, man. Mm-hmm. And then catchy songs and the same thing with Ace. You know, he was a, he's a very melodic player. There's not like there's no jazz burning at all. Mm-hmm. It's all about taking a pop song. Okay, so um, <laughs> well, I learned this baritone sax solo from this Ma- uh, this uh, Maynard Ferguson record. Learned it by ear, and that's something that, that even I still draw from. Not only inspiration, but there's things that come out of my playing, like licks that I vividly remember having my Walkman uh-huh. on, you know, nice and like put being outside because my parents were like get out of the house, you know, and I would just keep backing this cassette up, learning this solo. So. You know, I didn't understand. I knew it was the blues. Mm-hmm. You know, I could hear that. But like as far as understanding anything about how he put it all together, you know, I figured he did it just like I did. Like you just hear stuff and you want to do it, you know. And mm-hmm. and uh, so I get to Memphis State and this guy, it was Memphis State and it's University of Memphis now. But my mm-hmm. ba- this guy, the bass player is like, man, you need a sax mentor very badly and I'm playing a regular gig with this guy that would really be great for you. His name's Lanny McMillan. Uh, man, you ought to come to our gig this, you know, Sunday afternoon jazz gig at this place, whatever I show up. And it's that guy that was playing at Rum Boogie that uh, I saw like two or three years ago. That's crazy. And that's going to backtrack a little bit because the video stopped and uh-huh. want to make sure. So you had a few experiences. You were, you were playing saxophone in the high school band, you there were some recordings that you were listening to and learning from yeah. but you had a few moments that stood out one being in new orleans when you were 12 yeah. where you all came you heard a saxophone and then you saw a guy player. just standing in the street playing and you know like purple suit purple playing suit with one hand playing and had his arm around this gal yeah. you know and, and i'm just like man so you can do this you know like as a job like as yeah you yeah. know i mean you can do it beyond having to the structure of being in a concert band or marching band yeah you know like it, it just hadn't really clicked for me like that because uh everything there because there was no live music scene or in a venue or nothing nobody did that you had music in church mm-hmm. and it was a piano and sometimes they would have the organ also mm-hmm. classical organ not hip organ, <laughs> you know yeah and um you know, and so there was not, it was a disconnect, and uh, and so it was very revolutionary, man. Like you know, holy moly! Like these people are doing this all of their own free will, you know. Yeah. And it sounds like all the stuff I heard on the records. It sounds like the stuff I like that's on the records. Uh-huh. You, you know, see, you could. Well, it's interesting. So and then, and then four years later, you were you're the you were the only person from your town that got into the all. They got into band, like the honor honor, honor band. jazz band. And thing. when your teacher brought you down, you said you had that experience where you you drove. He took you to Beale, Beale Street, Street. You heard a saxophone player at the Rum Rum Boogie Boogie Cafe. Cafe, and and just like whoa, like it was like, like yeah, and this guy's like just wailing, you know, and. And he just happened, like I say, we were driving by because it was rainy and like nobody's out on the street and the street was real dead. And Rum Boogie was jumping, you know, mm-hmm. and they had the door open and we're driving by really slow and the window down, you know, it's like, like, oh gosh, I'm che- checking all this stuff out. And the dude just happened to be turned like, you know, towards the singer or to mm-hmm. somebody to end his where solo really or whatever. It, yeah. yeah, where I could really hear it. Just yeah. happened to be a thing, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, that's amazing. 
And so then a couple of years later, I, I get to college and, and need, this guy's telling me so I need, need a, a teacher. Mentor and that's, this and that's the guy. When I get there to the gig, I realize. How did you realize it was this, this was the guy? Well, I recognized. You, you remembered that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I mean, dude, you, there's not a lot of. That's why I can remember that cat was wearing a purple suit. You uh, know what I mean? It's like there's not a lot of interaction I'd had. Yeah. So, so those memories really stood oh, out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Lanny, uh, Lanny McMillan, the guy that I ended up taking lessons from, he uh, got into the recording studio right out of high school, uh, you know, grew up in Memphis and and started working with Isaac Hayes and, and people uh-huh. that were on the road, like, you know, which still can be the case, obviously, is you come here and you make a record, but these guys that are here making these records, this is what they do. And they play here in town. You mean like the studio guys? In the studio. Yeah. And, you know, they don't, they might go do a big tour, you know, mm-hmm. but that's rare. Mm-hmm. It has to pay and it's got to be, man, I can only be gone for, you know, six weeks or something max, you uh-huh. know, that kind of thing. And uh, so, yeah, those cats would make these records. And then you got to have all these other guys that are like in training to go out and do the road gigs. You know what I'm uh-huh. saying? And so Lanny, my teacher, you know, he's in high school and he's showing up and seeing all these people playing and he's kind of weaseling his way into the studio a little bit. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so then when that's like, well, we've cut this record and now we want these Memphis guys to go and like, oh, yeah, we'll send you our guys. And then they get the, the teenage kids. That's how the Barcades wound up uh-huh. backing up Otis Redding. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Okay. Booker T and those cats are cutting the record. Because the older guys didn't want to go. Yeah, there. man, they're, they're at home. They, they have their got, careers. Yeah, yeah, I got kids. I but got I mean, they, they were able to studio. work in town and yeah. not have that. that yeah. They got their gig. They're at the studio. They got their family. They got uh-huh. their house. They're not going to go out with Otis, you know. Yeah. But these 19, 16 to 19 year old kids, it's they're ready to, to go, yeah. you know, and they're hanging around the studio, bugging us to death. When you take these kids on the band, they, you know, on the road, they sound great, you know? Uh-huh. And so uh, Lanny kind of got into that. And so he would come home and do some sessions and then he would go out and play with a lot of heavy cats. And, uh, and also there were just more people playing the kind of music like R and B and blues and things like legit, you know, guys that um, were famous. People were, who made some of those people records. who made some of those records, yeah. you know, and so he's working with those cats and they lived here and worked here. And, and, and one of them's your mentor. Yeah. And so that guy, you know, turned out to be my mentor. And uh, he he was still going out and touring and, and doing things uh, with people. And he would go uh, to do festivals in Europe and stuff and, and things that where he might be gone for three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. And so he's got a house band gig at BB King's. He's in the house band there. Mm-hmm. And then he had like a jazz brunch every Sunday thing. And so he's like, well, all right, uh, you know, been in been about a year so you sounding pretty good so uh we gone you know july to whatever and you got the gig and i'm like i got the gig i, I like that like oh yeah okay great you know he's like now they want you there and you gotta wait you know what you're supposed to wear you know and you blah 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 i'm like are you kidding me you know and he's like no man you so know you 18, got, yeah 18 years old uh, you know like you gotta show hey man i had to do it you gotta uh, do it too you know that's how you do suit. it yeah you gotta wear the suit you uh-huh. know you gotta now, Thursdays we wear red, Fridays we wear blue, you know, that kind of thing. So you had to go buy red. And well, yeah, you got to find a red shirt, you know, uh, and a blue shirt, uh, and, you know, and then uh, don't, you know, learn all these tunes. And so, uh, yeah, man, so I kind of got thrown in there, I, you know, and uh, that so was really this, my this education. Is, this is late 80s. This would have been 91, 92. Okay. So and, you're, uh, you're working at a really early Yeah, age and age. working with a lot of, again, hanging out with older people. So I'm working with, with people that are definitely my parents age you uh, know and they they went through the same thing i've gone through and they're 20 years 25 years later down uh, the road you know and some of them were probably <laughs> really nice and kind and some were probably hard some are like oh man this kid you know yeah. and other ones are like oh man this kid we go you know we'll work him out uh, you know that kind of thing uh, and uh so it was great and in my playing you know obviously from doing it your playing uh, improves and your understanding of everything but then you also don't understand things and you're learning some bad habits too of like I don't know why we use this ending and you just think that everybody ends that song that way. And then you play in another band and you realize, well, that's just this band. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, uh, but again, about Memphis, there's, there's a lot of dinosaurs that, you know, it's still been roaming the, the earth here. And like, I've been able to work with a lot of heavy uh, session people on sessions Mm -hmm. and, you know, like Howard Grimes, the great Howard Grimes, the drummer, the bulldog that just passed last year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, working with him and it's love and happiness, man. You know, Al Green, this is the guy. He was, and, he was on that. Yeah, he's the drummer on that. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of, you know, O.V. Wright and Ann Peebles and stuff. 
and all these records that I've heard my whole life. And then now that guy's sitting there and I'm making a new record with this guy and mm -hmm. it sounds just like that, you know, mm -hmm. and here's the Hodges brothers that were the rhythm section on that record. They're still making gigs and I'm in the studio with those guys and it sounds just like that. So mm -hmm. those little dreams I had of getting to do that, you know, are happening, yeah. you know, and it's, it's crazy. And then, but the other thing that was weird is like, uh, you think like, well, now all of this, all of your dream world is going to come along with this uh -huh. dream work. And it's like, no, man, reality is still reality, you know? Uh -huh. And so that was a, a reason I think for some heavy drinking, you know, you think like, well, this guy's on television and you know, I, he's all on tour and he's doing all this stuff. And he's uh -huh. on all these records. He's probably driving a gold Cadillac and he's got a big house and he doesn't worry about anything. Uh, and, I see what you're you saying. know, and yeah. then reality is reality. It's like man. he's still needing to make his bills. And, and he's having to work with now. He's working with a, you know, 20 something year old kid, yeah. you know, and he's 45 years old, you mm -hmm. know, and because that's the continuum of the way this whole thing works. And I didn't understand that. And like I say, you know, you kind of condition yourself or, or numb yourself with alcohol or whatever. And, like this isn't what I thought it was going to yeah, be. Why yeah. am I in this messed up marriage? And why have I got a house note? And I don't even want a house, man. Uh, you know, and I want to stay in, you know, Santa Fe when this tour is over. Why do I got to go back? You mm -hmm. know, and and kind of things like that. But again, like that's not that's not that's some misguided, you know, dream. Whatever you think reality is is not what it is. When you're a kid, you know, mm -hmm. what I say, man, I, I had. Nothing, you, no experience. You have an idea around. of what you think it means to make it. Yeah. And, and you probably are like, I these guys have made it and I'm mm -hmm. on the path to making it because you're doing stuff. Like you're working. Yeah, I'm working with these people yeah. or I'm working in the same places. And and then you start, you know, getting into into bands that start touring and like, oh man, we're gonna be in a bus in no time, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and well, how about we all file bankruptcy? You know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of shit. So mm -hmm. um yeah, man. I mean, you know, it's it's been a, a, a just growing up and and figuring out you know things for yourself and not living in the. Dream. So you've you've only been a musician. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've worked at a music store for twenty eight years, mm -hmm. and twenty four of those years was fixing saxophones. Okay, as an independent contract. So you 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 would have a that's like your that would day be gig, my day gig, yeah. and and then some days you know I'd be gone. I'd be you know not some days it'd be months or whatever. I'd be on a tour and you know, come in when I'm home and fix my own horn, mm. you know, and hang out there. Everybody has some coffee, like still got a job, right? Yeah. Everything's cool. Okay. Right. See you later. You know, and the music store, Amro music store, been in business for a hundred years. Oh, wow. Owned. They're still there. Family owned. Yeah. Doing again? great. Amro music. Amro. And the Averwater family that owns it. Wonderful people to work for. They're in their fourth generation now. Wow. Of, uh, family leading the store. Yeah. Great huge music store and they're super cool people. And, um, that was like my job. So, you know, I had this mentor Lanny and I'm working these gigs with him and stuff and not getting what I needed at school. And part of it was being so far behind. Uh, and then the other part of like coming from a small town and now living in a larger town and just, man, you know, I'm on my own kind of, you know, and, mm -hmm. and like, I don't have, nobody's here to make me get up and go to school. Mm -hmm. And like, I've, you know, stayed out all night or whatever, hearing music or playing a gig or whatever, and don't make that eight o'clock English class or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so one thing led to another and I ended up getting a job through Lanny's drummer. He was the store manager at the music store. Mm -hmm. He's like, Hey man, we need somebody on the front counter selling reeds and stuff, you know? And I'm like, well, maybe I'll just quit school and just do that. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> little did I realize that pretty much anybody that does what I did in town has to come there to buy supplies and mm -hmm. buy manuscript paper or buy a piece of sheet music. Man, I got to play this wedding and they want the song. And I, you know, I ain't got time to figure it out by ear. Y'all got Evergreen by Barbara Stroud and whatever, uh, you know. Yeah, sure. And then you end up talking to them for 20 minutes and, mm -hmm. Well, I'm playing down so and so. You should come sit in. Or man, I heard you last night. You know, uh, and you're like, oh, really? So you're making all you kinds know, of I'm making all kinds of connections. Uh, and then, uh, hey, here's another tip: if you are able to sell saxophone reeds to other saxophone players and give them 20 percent off professional musicians discount, mm -hmm. uh, well, man, I really need a sub. You know, next Saturday, can you? Because me and you are tight. You uh, take care of me. You know, I'm going to take care of you. Wow. So it really turned out to be a great networking opportunity. Uh, 
And so I got to where I was working so much outside of the music store playing gigs that having to be there in the sales aspect of it was, it was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the instrument repair aspect, those guys were independent contractors could kind of come and go as uh, they need it. And a lot of them were retired band directors and musicians that just didn't get called anymore. Older guys that just, man, I'm tired of making club dates, mm -hmm. you know, I'd rather play once a month with friends and just not be out six nights a week. Yeah. You know, whatever. So all those cats are upstairs. So again, this goes back to hanging out with older dudes. Mm -hmm. So I like start saying, I want to, I want to learn how to fix saxophones, which I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like, well, okay, hang out after you finish down here today, come up for a couple hours and somebody show you something. Mm -hmm. So, Within a little bit of time, I transitioned into the repair aspect of it and tons of old dudes up there with monumental advice and life experience mm -hmm. and a knowledge of songs and arrangements. Mm -hmm. And then you hear all the cast that they all played with. A whole, the so the whole other education they, happened there. A whole there. other education. And, and did you there. find the advice was typically good? Oh, yeah. The, the reason why I asked that is uh, I was listening to this interview with Rick Rubin, and he was talking about how when someone gives you advice, uh, they're giving you advice based on their life, yeah. and that doesn't necessarily always apply to you. That's but, true. But, but but I I agree with that, and I also think that if you know the people that you're dealing with, you filter that advice mm -hmm. into a way that, that it's it can all be beneficial. Yeah, you know? yeah. Even if nothing else at the end of the day, it turns out to be a hilarious anecdote that you can share with somebody else but that something happened to my friend this guy i worked with this crazy guy. Uh, listen yeah. to this you know yeah, this is what he told me <laughs> this to you do. think your gig's bad uh, listen to what happened to this cat you know uh, and so it was great man and then again you're fixing horns now for people that you are interacting with and you're on the stage with somebody and the trumpet players vows man come in in the morning man i'll tell so-and-so you're coming to fix you up you uh, and we'll do it for free. You know, we'll just, you'll be in out in 15 minutes. So you're, 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 you're helping people out. You're, so you're at, you're of service there. Yeah. And huh, that's so cool. Um, so you're playing more and more and you're able to be a contractor. Yeah. Um, and so I'm out, I, I start, um, uh, you know, I'd been working in local bands and then, uh, you know, you find people that, that you have similarities or like stylistic things you want to pursue or guys that you go like, man, if I could play in a band with that guy, you mm -hmm. know, and then eventually, you know, things line up where that can happen. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I wound up through the music store. One of the repair guys lived in an apartment building with Bobby Bland, Bobby blue bland, the world's greatest blues singer. Mm -hmm. His music director lived in the same apartment building as this guy that does repairs, who's mm -hmm. also a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. Well, the guy that they had, Morris Atchison from Kansas City, was flaking on the gig. And so Joe Harden, the band leader for Bobby, is like, runs into Archie like in the elevator. And he's like, man, we've been having so much trouble with this guy. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, be? would you want to make a tour? Would you do a weekend? Just anything, just in case this cat, whatever. Archie's like, man, I, I ain't going to do it. But look, this kid... You know, he's good. Uh -huh. Call him, you know? Yeah. So, man, Archie told me that, like, later that day. And literally, like, two days later, at, like, six in the morning, my phone rings. Uh -huh. and it's like, uh, yeah, man, look, I uh, got your number from Archie. This is pre-cell phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is calling from a payphone at the hotel where the band's meeting and they're leaving, you know? Wow. Like, and so, like, look, this saxophone player is supposed to be here. We've been waiting since midnight. The boss says it's time to go, man. You want to go to Kansas City today? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't go to Kansas City right now. I just can't uh, pack my shit and go. I just I can't go. Uh -huh. you know? But I want to do this gig. If this uh -huh. happens again, call me. Uh -huh. and he's like, well, we're going to have a talk with the boss. And, you know, I'll probably be calling you another week or two. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, great. So I'm just like, again, Bobby Bland, somebody I've seen on television. I've heard his records my whole life. And I remember seeing those commercials for like a blues compilation that's got members only. And he's got this Jerry curl and everything. <laughs> and I'm just like, Oh my God, this guy, you know? And uh, so yeah, about two weeks later, Joe Harden calls me back. He's like, man, you ready to go? And I'm like, yeah, when are we leave? And he's like, well, tonight at like whatever. You know? uh, and I'm like, dude, it's like the night before Thanksgiving, uh -huh. you know, like the gig is the first gig is Thanksgiving lunch at like the armory they do this gig every, every year, like in Kansas city, uh -huh. you know? And, uh, I'm like, okay, well, uh, and I just got married to my first wife, you know, mm -hmm. and we were having a big Thanksgiving thing, like her folks house, you know, and everything. 
And he's like, we'll be here at midnight, you know, and we're going to drive all night. The gig is like at noon at this armory thing mm. and blah, blah, blah. And we'll be out just for this one and we'll come back. You know, I'm like, okay. So, uh, you know, kind of get it worked out and go do that gig. And it was so crazy, man. And just you're there and here's the world's greatest blues singer. And you here's all these songs. And the charts that they had were from the recording sessions from the 50s and 60s. Wow. And like they're falling apart, man. Like, wow. you know, paper is just disintegrating. So <laughs> you're trying to read. And then there's just a chunk of the music that's just not there. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And like I dug blues and I checked out some of the dude's records, but I'm not like a deep catalog guy on Bobby Bland at that uh, time, you know? Yeah. So it was a huge learning experience. Plus just the whole thing, the whole thing, man, being on a tour bus, uh, the only white guy, a kid, yeah. you know, and the youngest guy. Probably, young, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there was a trumpet player they had hired from Jackson, Mississippi. That was by age. Uh -huh. And so uh, he, it was like his first gig too. Uh -huh. Darnell Phillips. And he's in LA now uh, doing recording stuff. He's an engineer, uh -huh. still plays trumpet. He's a great trumpet player, but he's uh, ended up working. He worked for Coca-Cola in Atlanta for a long time doing commercials, like doing big uh -huh. time uh, commercials. That's cool. But um, anyhow, yeah, so I did that gig, man, and uh, it was a great education. Got to tour the country. Got so, so, so you stayed on that Stayed gig. on that gig. How, how long did um, you do it for? That first time was about 10 months, 11 months. That, that's like nonstop? <clears throat> no, you, I mean, it was like come back, it was weekends uh -huh. mostly. And uh, because of his age at that time, too, um, so he wasn't out, you know, hitting it like he was, but he didn't fly. He was afraid to fly. Oh, so okay. if you're playing Los Angeles, well, we're leaving two days early because wow. we're driving all the way across it. You know, a lot of road time, a lot of road time, a lot of like weird, crazy cultural things, you know, to learn about. I got to play the Apollo, um, got to do a lot of shows with B.B. King, uh, also played the VFW in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And both of those gigs paid the same, the Apollo or the VFW. It doesn't uh, matter. You know, uh, it's, it's just what you get paid. Man. Yeah, you you got your amount. Every this is day. what you get, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, my bunk in, in the bus was right near Mr. Bland's. He, he had the back end of the bus, you know. And so my bunk was right there. And so I would hear him singing along with records or talking. And then I'd get like a little knock on the wall, you know, and I'd pull my curtain back. And, What's up, Mr. Bland? He's like, and I had my head shaved and I was chubby. He called me Curly, you know, from the Three Stooges. Uh -huh. Curly, we're going to stop up here at the Flying J or whatever. And it's like, go in there and get me. You know what I like, go in there and get it for me. And I was like, okay. So you go in and you get a Hostess cupcake. Uh -huh. kind of with this the chocolate with the white yeah. icing on top. Yeah. He loved Hostess cupcakes and uh, like Stewart's orange cream sodas. Okay. <clears throat> and he good, wasn't supposed to have that. Good healthy diet. Yeah, wasn't supposed <laughs> to have it, you uh -huh. know. But and he, so, he sent you. He'd be sending you go in there, you know, uh, give me like five bucks uh, or something. And I'd go in there and get it and bring it back to him. All right, you did all right. And uh, you know, it was just great, man. And uh, I still have friends from that band and experience. And, and, then, and you know, that, that part of the education must have been amazing. Oh too. man, just the hanging out. And the cat, he played saxophone a little bit. So and he couldn't sleep at night because uh, he'd be a little nervous on the road or whatever. And so I'd be up front, you know, drinking beer or whatever, hanging out, and it just maybe be me. And he'd come up front and tell me some stories, play some records, sing some songs. And then, man, won't you go get your horn out? And I'm thinking he wants me to play it. He wanted to play it. Uh -huh. And so he's playing my saxophone, you know. Uh -huh. And I'm just like, this is amazing. And one of the most surreal things was I was practicing in the dressing room. You know, like you get to the gig, you wake up, and you're at the venue, it's 11. There's nobody there until 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a dressing room, you know, by myself, middle of the afternoon. And Mr. Blank comes in and. I hear what you're doing in there, young man. I hear what you're doing. I'm like, oh, you yeah, know, Mr. Bland, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he comes in, pulls a chair up, and, and I'm like, well, what is this all about? You know, and I'm working out like jazz standards and stuff out mm -hmm. of a fake book. You mm -hmm. know? And um, anyway, he's like, you know that song? You don't know what love is? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, let's do it. And so then he, you don't know what love is. Real soft. And I'm like, playing real soft mm. and he's like no no do do like i do mm. and i'm like okay and so then he would you don't know and i'd be like fuh, fuh, fuh. He's like, all right uh -huh. i love you once again you know quiet. yeah just trying to play quiet and mm. getting lyrical oh man i'm, I'm getting yeah. tripped back but That's amazing uh, yeah um yeah that was super heavy yeah that's a special experience. Yeah, man. So anyway, every time I play this song, I make it him. Mm. But uh, he was great. And so uh, he called me back later 
you know, we're like, man, we're going to Japan. I got to have you, you know, we're going, I'm going to play New York. Uh, we're doing the uh, BBs up there for like five nights. Mm -hmm. like, I got to have you. This yeah. is after you weren't in the oh, band. after I wasn't in the band. So, so I would come on. back and do. Right. So things, he thought a know? lot of you. He did. He, he really did. And yeah. I mean, I don't want to be like projecting myself as anything, you know, but uh, I'm well, but definitely no, I mean, but respectful, but he was like, he, he saw something. And yeah. well, and also you played with him long enough that you had that connection too. Yeah, and you know he 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 liked where I was coming from, you know. And it was funny because uh, when you play your solo, you know, you got to come for the. There might be a mic or two mics in front of the way out in front of the horns. Mm -hmm. And when he's on stage, as quietly as I was just singing there, he wants the band to get that quiet. Mm -hmm. Two drummers, mm -hmm. you know. We had two drummers. Two drummers. Really, four horn players, you know, guitar, bass. So the stage volume is low. Once, once every at times, at times, and then bah, uh, you know, it's a really bah, dynamic, bah, bah, you know, huge, like and then a big band. Wow. You know, because he's got he's a pillow talker, you know. Uh -huh. And so anyhow, man, you go to do your solo. Like I say, there might be there might be two mics out in front of the horns, right? Uh -huh. And you got to go. You know, they take all right, go, go, go. And so he's over there looking at you holding his microphone. What does go mean? Go over there to where he's holding the microphone and go play the solo he's in his the, mic. He's going to hold the microphone he's for you while you're solo. You. Oh, wow. okay. And so then that's your every night, man. Like, And if you got more than one solo a night, it's every solo. He's looking at you. Uh-huh. And then if you're sucking... Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Pushes you out of the way. It's you know? a short solo. Yeah, short one. That's but time. more time if you're really. Yeah, and if you're really, on. and then you're thinking, man, I, I'm done it. I'm hitting my pinnacle, and he's like, go on. And then you're like, now what do I do? You yeah, know, like, I just, just did it. Oh, you know, right. and That's so that cool. was so much great trial by fire there. Oh, you yeah. know, and uh, and and just the he, you know, very seldom with me. He did it more with the guitar player who was much more advanced, Charlton Johnston, who, who Johnson who played with uh, the Basie band. Mm. Um, but anyway, he, he would do a lot more with the guitar player where he would sing lines like he was doing with me in the dressing room and Charlton would play them back and they would have like, a conversation. But I got to do that a little bit with him on stage and that was incredible. And so, you know, came back home and from doing that gig, I got the house band gig at BB Kings for mm. like five nights a week from mm. having that experience. Because before then, I was like a kid that played with one of the hippie bands, you know, mm. and whatever. Every and night, so yeah. people sitting in Jim Belushi, you know, people from other bands like Aerosmith or met Dave Matthews and Leroy Moore from Dave Matthews band experiences. And so from there, uh, some of the guys in the house band were peeling off from that and starting something else. And these were people that I was saying, like, man, if I could ever get in a band with those guys and we could do some other kind of music, you know. And so that opportunity happened and uh, was in this group called the Gamble Brothers Band, mm -hmm. and they're from Muscle Shoals, but they're mm -hmm. both living in, in Memphis. Uh, Chad has since moved back to Muscle Shoals, and he plays uh, with Jason Isbell in the 400. You know? Oh, okay. And uh, then Al plays in St. Paul and the Broken Bones. Yeah. And so okay, they they are on television and at the Grammys all the time. I've interv interviewed <laughs> interviewed the drummers for both of those bands. Oh no, kidding! So yeah. did you interview Chad? I did. Yeah, well, that's yeah. my that's my homie, man. And I used to play with some effects, so I'll get back into doing that a little bit. And I bought this amp over here and and some pedals, and uh, so we started touring, and we were together for about six years, and made three records, and toured all over the country and Canada. Uh, that was when my son was born was was during that time, mm -hmm. and uh, so from there from there. I had met JJ Gray from Mofro and they were just Mofro at that time, mm. but uh, started a relationship with those guys. And uh, JJ again was like super cool and liked me as a person as well as my plan. And we were doing the Bell Share Festival in Asheville and he was uh, like a featured singer with Galactic on a run. You okay. know what I mean, they, they were starting to get into when the, the house man who was their original singer was getting too sick to tour. They started just getting other friends of theirs to come out and sing, mm -hmm. you know, do a leg of the tour or whatever. So yeah. JJ had a break with Mofro, went out with those guys. We're on this thing. I was so excited that they were all on the bill and they were playing like the next band after us or mm -hmm. whatever, you know. And so I'm hanging out with those dudes on the bus and we're drinking moonshine and like <laughs> being crazy. And JJ's like, man, I just did this new record and I got horn players, man, on it. It's the first record. I've had a horn section. He's like, man, would you ever be interested in like going and doing like a tour or something? Cause these guys, I got in New York to do it. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. going to do it. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would be an honor and a privilege, you know, mm -hmm. and I would love it. It'd be so much fun. And he's like, well, look, I don't forget it, man. I'm going to hit you up, you know? And so this was like July. You mm -hmm. know? And so things have been hard struggling with the Gamble brothers, like to say six years, three records, not really getting anywhere, losing money, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. It didn't feel like you were getting traction. Didn't feel like, yeah. I mean, kind of like we had maybe, maybe peaked, you know, uh -huh. a little bit. And so, uh, the Mofro offer comes up and JJ's like, man, it's just three months, you know, and it's going to pay this. It's going to be on a bus. You ain't got to touch one case, mm -hmm. you know, got, got some hotels. Most of us going to be living on this bus though. Cause we're playing like every night, you know, uh -huh. and doing radio and, and do all kinds of stuff. It's going to be intensive, you know, and if I could just borrow you from those guys, you know, mm -hmm. And so I had to tell Al Gamble, you know, I was like, man, I, I got this offer. I'm going to do this thing, but it's just short term, you know? And, and he's like, well, okay, man, that's cool. I mean, I understand, you know, whatever. And mm -hmm. so the, anyway, that ended up being kind of the end of that mm -hmm. group, you know, because the JJ thing turned into being seven and a half years and okay. not just being a three month mm -hmm. thing, you know? And uh, that, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. so there I go, my son is born and now I'm missing a lot of my mm -hmm. kids life, you know? And you two or seven months, eight months out of the year, and then you're home. But it's not like a block of seven months, you know, but it's scattered out. So you're gone most of the time and you're home for miss, 10 days. Missing all kinds of missing all kinds yeah. of stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, like Dewey Cox says, I'm going to miss some births, you know, I, not just birthday. It's like, <laughs> I'm just, there's going to be things I'm not going to be here for. Uh, and so uh, that started that. And then um, from being with JJ, bigger circuit, a lot of European tours back to Japan. Uh, and then meeting the next tour, uh, you know, tier of performers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I had played with Levon Helm a couple of times in Memphis. And what was so freaky was I just started reading uh, This Wheels on Fire, Levon's book, oh. like about a week before. And, you know, mm -hmm. So I'm kind of on a roll from this Bobby Bland thing, you know, and all this. And, mm -hmm. and so I mean, with Mofro and... Levon is on a few of the same kind of festivals we're playing. And uh, my wife, Christy, is friends with uh, Eric Lawrence, who's in the saxophone, on the horn section, plays saxophone for uh, the backing band, you know, with, that plays with Levon that, that does the rambles uh, oh, at yeah. his barn. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's his touring group. And so, mm -hmm. and she's like, uh, hey, my buddy Eric, I saw you're going to be where my friend Eric is. You guys ought to hook up, you know, saxophone mm -hmm. player and Levon, all that shit. And so we're at the Floyd Fest and uh, like Floyd, Virginia, and mm -hmm. Eric and I are talking. He's like, well, come on the bus and we get on the bus and I meet this guy, Jay Collins, who's also in the horn section. Turns out he's Levon's son-in-law. He's married to Amy Helm. Mm -hmm. And he's also Donald Fagan's son-in-law because uh -huh. Amy is Donald's stepdaughter. Okay. But he had, he had kind of raised her. So uh -huh. anyhow, this guy, Jay Collins, uh, he's also Greg Al Almond's music director. Mm -hmm. So we chatted up and talk and all the stuff and kind of exchange numbers or whatever. So time marches on and uh, Greg is Allman is it's 2011, I guess. And he had just gotten his transplant and stuff and was like made a new record that uh, T-Bone Burnett had done and they were touring and picking up horn sections in a few towns, you know, like uh, New Orleans, Memphis, Chicago, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Jay Collins has my number. Jay is Greg's music director. Mm -hmm. Hey bro, are you going to be in Memphis this time? Blah, blah, blah. We're playing this festival. I'm like, dude, I'm already playing two times on this festival and I would kill to play with Greg. Allman. Yeah, absolutely. So he's okay, great. So me and my buddy, Mark Franklin go down and make the Greg hit and uh, meet him. And he was such a gentleman. They sent you music. Is what they send you or how did you prepare? Yeah, I just show up. You yeah. just you just know his catalog. Well, yeah, they've got some charts, they have charts so you're going to sight read it on the gig with Jerry Jamat playing bass. So you knew that, uh, yeah. I was uh, told this is what's going to happen. Okay, you know, and so okay, so uh, show up and try to do your best, not you know wet yourself or whatever. <laughs> and so anyway, that was crazy. 2011. I'm still in Mofro on tour. Uh, it's 20 2013 2013 New Year, so going into 2014. Mm -hmm. Mofro, JJ Gray and Mofro and Greg Allman, like a Florida run, double bill for like uh, okay. five nights. Mm -hmm. Playing like House of Blues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Jay Collins, hey, I see you're with Mofro. You know, Greg loves having horns. Would you guys be into, you know, jumping up? Greg wants you guys to come on and play. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let me talk to JJ. JJ's like, yeah, man, of course. It's Greg Allman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, we rehearse some stuff in the dressing room with uh, me and the trumpet player from Mofro, and then we do a couple of shows, you know, with Greg. Greg's like, mm, I need to get me a horn section. That's mm. what I need, you know? And so uh, he's like, oh, maybe we could just borrow you guys from JJ, you mm. know, which is kind of like what JJ had said about the Gamble Brothers. Like, maybe I could just borrow uh, you from the Gamble Brothers for a little bit, you know? And so anyway, man, uh, we do the gig and it was great. And we do about three or four of the five nights and Greg's real cool. And uh, it's New Year's Day. I land in Memphis and my phone rings and it's Jay Collins. We just played New Year's in Florida, you mm. know, with, with Greg. And so he's like, uh, hey, bro. Uh, yeah, man. Greg's doing a DVD shoot like in two weeks in Georgia. And he wants you and Dennis, the trumpet player, to be on it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, OK, I'll be there. You know, mm -hmm. so. All right. So they're going to just call you and tell you how much money and. You know, the travel, et cetera, you know, one off, but it's a film thing. OK, yeah. OK. So I'm like, holy crap. So go down there to Macon and do this. Greg, we're filming. You know, Greg stands up. Want to introduce you all to my new horn section. You know, Art mm. Edmiston, Dennis Marion, blah, blah, blah. And me and Dennis were looking at each other like, oh, my God. Right. So then he's like, well, I want y'all to go to Australia and I want y'all to, you know, can y'all come out? We don't have any dates till like March, but can y'all just join me in March? It's like, well, man, we're we're in this other band, you know, mm -hmm. we can't really do that. So then it gets down to like, well, I, I'm going to pay you and I'm Greg Allman, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, OK, you know. And so it was kind of like it was sucked to leave mm -hmm. JJ and I didn't want to get out of the Mofro family. But, you, time loyal, when, but yeah. you know, when you get a call from somebody who's a legend and somebody, again, that my whole life I'd looked up to and loved the Allman Brothers and Greg's solo albums, you know. Mm -hmm. And so. um it worked out where I ain't kidding. The Mofro holes in the schedule was when Greg was not doing an Allman Brothers shows and was doing solo band shows. And it was like that for months mm -hmm. where we could fly from one and fly to the next just tour. Lucked out. Just lucked out. Right? Wow. So that went pretty good until it came time to like record JJ's record. And JJ's record was supposed to be recorded at this time. And Greg's tour started at this time. And then this is one's getting pushed back and this one's getting moved forward. Uh, no. And it gets to that point where they're going to happen at the same time. Uh -huh. And this was the first record that JJ had like, let me write horn parts and mm -hmm. collaborate with him on horn parts. Cause mm -hmm. he's, he's got a lot of ideas. He's very, you know, he knows what he wants. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's great. So, uh, but this was the first time he was like, man, I want you to have some input too. And we work together on stuff. And, and now I wasn't going to be there to cut it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, all I did is I asked you to make sure that you made this record and that's all I it needed from mm -hmm. you. And now you're like turning your back on, me, mm -hmm. you know? And one of the things I'll say about that cat is he is extremely loyal and uh, takes it very seriously, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, I was offensive, you know, by leaving at that time, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think things were a little weird for a while, but since we have definitely made up and jammed together since then and had, you know, everything's cool. But uh, so I went and did the Greg thing and did the last like three years of his life and tours and record and got nominated for a Grammy. And, um, you know, that was such a wonderful experience. And again, now here I'm on another tier of like rock royalty, yeah. you know, of Peter Frampton, ZZ Top, Doobie Brothers. Like you're you doing know, tours with on those tours those with dudes. those dudes and yeah. playing festivals and now we're which all... means you're you're actually like you're you're in the same room with these people. Oh yeah, right. man, and hanging out and telling yeah. dirty jokes and like, like, like pals. Yeah, okay. I mean all it's right. like we're work, we're at work. Uh -huh. It's the same thing that happens everywhere you are. Everybody's just people, you yeah. know. And so again, going back to that, like I was thinking, reality was, but man, we're all just humans. Man, yeah. these guys got car notes too. They're uh -huh. just more expensive cars. Yeah, but you know they're car notes and they got. They got a maybe a twenty five thousand square foot, you know, recreational area, and I've got this little room we're sitting in now, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, everything's the same, man. And uh, everybody was just super cool. And you find out too that all of those people, the majority of of anybody that you look up to like that, they are the sweetest, nicest people. And when they meet other genuinely sweet people mm -hmm. it's just a natural thing you know you just all get along and you all go eat together and you everything is so cool mm -hmm. you know not like what television or movies portray as this there are those people there mm -hmm. but you know 
they want, those people tend not to still be out there doing it. It sounds like you've had the experience of meeting some of your heroes and them being cool. Like some people say, oh, you should never meet your heroes. Yeah, but I'd have to say those people were all super cool. Yeah, because I mean, I, I mean, I haven't met all, that many of my heroes, but the ones I have met were super cool. Yeah, yeah. So it was great, and it's just been a, a really amazing experience. And so when Greg passed, um, I was just really like at a loss of what to what do, do uh, and. Financially, it was, uh, you know, uh, we had a lot of things on the, the plate. And so like, that's so the schedule got cleared out all of a sudden. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, hey, dude is too sick to work. We're on hold and you're not on salary. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? And so we're just waiting. And then unfortunately, he passed. And so there I was, you know, and like, what am I going to do now? And I got a call from Dee Dee Bridgewater who's a jazz singer yeah, I, and yeah. a very famous NEA jazz master, She's amazing incredible. performer, artist, everything. And she had just made her Memphis record. She was born here and okay. spent early life here, but then was raised in Detroit. Yeah. Okay. Her dad, turns out her dad was a very well out of that. I got a call from the Doobie brothers and um, went and did a couple three shows in a, as a horn section and then they were coming up on, because uh, normally they just tour with a sax, saxophone player, Mark Russo. Mm-hmm. And they had, in, had picked up a couple, three of the Almond Camp people when Greg passed, like mostly production, but also the master, uh, Tim Bali and conga player, uh, Mark Quinones, okay. who was in the Almond Brothers. He was also in Greg's solo band. Oh, okay. And so then he started playing with the Doobies. Mm-hmm. And so um, Quinones is there, and then Mark Russo, and I get a call, uh, me and my buddy, Mark Franklin, the trumpet player that I was on the road with Greg and, and Bobby with, you know, and, um, and he's in the boat keys and all, all stuff. Anyway, uh, me and Mark get called to go do some horn section dates, just kind of one-offs with the doobies. And then we get called to play the Ryman and in Nashville. In Nashville. And uh, it's like, man, is this is a big deal. It's a big deal. I'm like, I know it's a big deal. I played the Ryman. I know it's, you know, very, you know, well, this is, this is a real big deal, though, man. It's a real hmm. big deal. I'm like, okay, it's a big deal. And then you get there, you do the sound check and everything. It's like, you know, and there's a lot of cameras and stuff. And it's kind of, maybe this is a big deal. Like, what's going on, you know? And then, tell you what's going on. like, no, tell me what's going on, right. right? So then I turn around and there's Michael McDonald uh-huh. in the wings, you know? And I'm like, what's going on now? And it's like, well, Mike's about to come out. Uh-huh. And Mike hadn't been on stage with them in a while. You know? uh-huh. And I am a huge Michael McDonald fan. And my mother is an amazing <laughs> Michael McDonald fan. And so anyhow, Mike comes out and we play and then they're like, okay, you horn, extra horn guys, get off stage, you know, like while we're on stage, you know, get on stage and the cameras are going and everything. So we like kind of just step out into the wings, you know, Mm -hmm. and they're filming and getting up on Mike and getting Mike in the band and everything, Mm -hmm. do the big bow. It's on CNN, everything Mm -hmm. the next morning, Doobie Brothers 50th anniversary tour, Michael McDonald rejoins the Doobie Uh, Brothers for this epic tour epic tour thing it's just uh-huh. like the this hey we made the news this is what's going on so uh-huh. hey man you want to go on tour next year and be a doobie brother for six months right? uh-huh. and i'm like dream come true right? yeah you know and it'd be playing baritone saxophone and playing with mark russo who's an amazing musician mm-hmm. and a lot you know the there's the memphis connection with doobies because the memphis horns uh-huh. toured as a part of the Doobie Brothers in uh-huh. the 70s and made made the recordings with the Doobies. Uh-huh. Wayne and Andrew and James Mitchell and these guys that were in the Doobie Brothers, Jack Hale, uh, were in the Memphis Horns, were mm-hmm. part of the Doobie Brothers. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we were kind of keeping that Memphis horn thing, you know, connection there mm-hmm. and playing charts that they had recorded with those guys, you know. And so it was going to be cool, man. And then the pandemic happened. Well, that was the Doobie Brothers tour that never happened, you know, so the whole thing got shut down. And then whenever they did go out to do the 50th anniversary tour, there wasn't a horn section in the uh, budget kind of thing. They, it was, changed. A lot of things changed. You wow. Know? Anyhow, that was kind of the last big thing that I uh, was involved with. Uh, I've just been here working these like restaurant gigs and doing sessions. And then I do some, as the clubs have reopened, doing some club dates with other bands, but up to the pandemic um, in February of 2020, I had 42 gigs in 28 days and that was all local. And I was in, uh, not that everybody was working all the time, but I was in 13 bands wow. and like only two of them were my own projects. Everything mm-hmm. else was as a side man or mm-hmm. whatever. And so I was extremely busy and then, you know, just everything changed. And uh, 
so I'm very fortunate to have what I have and I'm making a living playing background music essentially, mm -hmm. you know, and then I get to step out uh, and play some other creative things. Mm -hmm. and, oh, you play with Rock Alam? Playing Bob with Moses. Rock Alam, Bob Moses. Yeah. And uh, it's such a blessing that he's here because there hasn't been anybody uh, involved in the type of uh, artistry that he embodies living here, you know, to communicate with and learn from and to play with. There hasn't been anybody, you know, like that here because Memphis is not a place that even though it's a music city, it doesn't support the most avant-garde mm -hmm. type of stuff. I mean, it's an entertainment yeah. place, you know, yeah. and that's what the music comes from. It's a church, you know, uh, the blues. I mean, we don't have to retread this, you know, but the church thing is huge here. The Saturday night, Sunday morning thing is very much reality of playing with these guys till two in the morning that are some of the nastiest, funkiest playing guys and then they're at church at like seven, eight, you know, five hours, six hours later, they're at church playing for the church thing, you know, mm -hmm. and doing it all day long, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's life for a lot of, a lot of the musicians here, you know, a lot of people have church gigs. I bat for the other team. I play the brunches. I get the people <laughs> after church, you uh -huh. know, they want the mimosa, uh -huh. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's, you know, uh, I played jazz and R and B and country and rock and, then I played pop tunes, you know, popular standard tunes and uh, play with different combinations of people and back up a lot of singers. That's been another great thing. Uh, the, the restaurant gigs that I do are steady and they're like every night. But the cool thing is it's a different person that I play with in every duo setting. Oh, yeah. And so you kind of get there's some tunes that cross over, mm. but maybe do them in different keys mm -hmm. or do a different arrangement or feel or whatever. Mm. And then that kind of keeps it fresh. And also you learn more about yourself and, and about other people's approach, you know, and then it, it's just a beautiful experience, really. And you know? have that, there's a lot of variety. There's so a lot of variety, yeah. even for it to be kind of almost day job ish uh -huh. in the repetition of it. It's still, there's a lot to get from it, you uh -huh. know? And then, like I said earlier, you know, these people may be having an anniversary or a birthday or whatever, man, what's, <laughs> what's better than making them happy? Yeah. You know? It's just been great, man. I've had a wonderful life and, and for all the things that I thought was weird or not enough, you know, uh, it, up to this point, I turned 50 last summer. You know, it's been incredible. And the experiences I've had from being a very much behind uh, education wise uh, musician playing to the cows in the backyard and and marching around my little backyard, you know, and then practicing my band. Uh, marching band steps in the backyard and stuff, you know, like doing that to like playing for 60,000 people, you know, with Greg Allman on my, my, my all time favorite songs, Come and Go Blues. And then my best friend and his wife were there. You know, he and I grew up listening to Greg Allman together mm. and I was able to bring him to the show and it's not tell him who I was playing with. Full you know? circle moment. Yeah. You yeah. know, and just having that. I mean, that's it's a great life, man. I'm, you know. You gotta have bumps and bruises. You gotta just try to make the best out of it, you know. But hopefully, the the newest chapter is gonna be, you know, even better than ever. And it might be to fewer listeners, but I think that the music that I'm making is more important to me as an artist, and then um, trying to become an artist, you know, mm -hmm. uh, myself, and not just be a a side man, you mm -hmm. know, forever. And trying to figure out what that is. And, and again, going back to working with different singers, you know, and being, be it Bobby Bland or Greg Allman or Michael McDonald or JJ Gray, but also the people I work with locally that may not be as well known, but man, there's so much talent in Memphis. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. The people that I get to play with at a restaurant, you yeah. know, it's yeah. unbelievable and uh, what you can do and what you can get away with. And it, it, so there's a lot you can learn, you know, and it's just being open to the experience. And so, like I say, trying to, take from those people what I can do to, to turn what I do into more of an artistic statement. You know, mm -hmm. it's always going to be heartfelt from coming from me because that's just who I am. But, mm -hmm. you know, trying to take it beyond, uh, you know, uh, entertainment into another realm of making artistry out of it or finding artistry in it or, or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that's the next thing for me. And, um, working towards finally getting a solo record or nine done and, mm -hmm. and different, you know, more experimental projects and more 
artistic projects and less commercial, mm. you know, but I mean, hopefully I'll still have commercial music availabilities, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're doing plenty of, yeah, yeah. I'm trying. Yeah. 